All right, we are back in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, and we're getting close to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Been a good long while. Um, we're looking at verses 15 through 20, and I know in your bulletin it says we're looking at the next passage, of course, that's because I wasn't here last week and I messed the bulletins up again, so you're welcome. Um, but we're looking at verses 15 through 20, let's go there now. Looking again at God's word, where it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. Uh, We're talking about the importance of your word. And I pray, uh, God, as I begin to preach, that I would be reminded of the weighty responsibility of of preaching the truth of your word, not man's opinion, not popular opinion, not not the word of the culture, uh, but Lord, your word. God, I pray that you would move me aside, that your word would speak to your people this morning for their good. In Jesus' name, amen. If there's anything our culture hates today, It's telling someone they are not what they say they are. If I say I'm a woman, you're supposed to believe me. It doesn't matter that I have a beard and that everything about me screams that I'm a man. If I say that I'm a woman, you're supposed to believe me. Not just go along with me. Believe me, affirm me in that. You better believe it too. Isn't that the way it goes these days? It's impolite to state the obvious, no matter how obvious. If someone says they're a thing, they are that thing, and you're, you better say so or else. So who are you to say someone is not a Christian if that's what they say they are. That's the subject that we're looking at in, at this point in Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. How can we tell if someone is a Christian? How can we tell if a preacher or a pastor is a Christian? Isn't the Christian thing to do just to take their word for it? Not according to Jesus. Jesus. He says there are predators out there. There are pretenders and imposters, people who claim to be something that they are not, and he says that they're dangerous. So looking back here at verse 15, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. What's Jesus' warning there? It's it's, It's not a trick question. I mean... It says, beware of false prophets, right? Beware of false prophets. Why do we have to be aware? Wouldn't we know one when we see one? Probably not, Jesus says. Because they don't come in waving a banner that says false prophet on it. You know, they don't show up wearing red tights and carrying a pitchfork. They look like you. They talk like you. They say they believe the same things that you do. They come to you in Jesus' name. They come to you in sheep's clothing. Outwardly, they appear safe. Inwardly, Jesus says, they are ravenous wolves. They're not so obvious as we may think, so be aware, Jesus says. Examine them carefully. They will use the same language, the same lingo, and the difference in And what they believe and their teaching and the Bible's teaching may seem subtle at first, but it will lead you astray. You know, and here's the thing, right? 
if someone stood in the pulpit and just flat out denied the deity of Christ, you know, going way back, Arian heresy, right? There was a day in which he was not. He was a created being, that God created Jesus. He was the first of his creation. You'd be like, what? If somebody stood up here and denied the virgin birth or the resurrection, you, you, would, you would immediately call them a heretic. That's a wolf that's easy to spot. Didn't even bother trying to dress himself up and disguise himself. That's an easy wolf to spot. But what Jesus is warning us about is the kind that wears sheep's clothing, the ones that you can easily and readily accept their teaching. You let them in. You sit under their instruction, under their influence, under their counsel. There's so much that seems familiar and attractive and pleasant about them. So it's not that a false prophet makes you feel uncomfortable and raises a bunch of red flags right away. Instead, he makes you quite comfortable. That's how Satan always works, right? He's always masquerading as an angel of light, always making you feel comfortable. Surely you will not die. Remember that in the garden? Surely you will not die. You know, so that's alarming that these pretenders can go unnoticed so easily, but, but the good news is that Jesus doesn't say we can't ever know for sure, does he? He says, verse 16, you will recognize them by their fruits. And then he begins to reason with us. He says, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. Now, Jesus doesn't want his disciples, he doesn't want us Christians, his followers, he doesn't want us to be led astray. There's a real danger here, but he doesn't say you can't know. He says you can know. You can know them by what kind of fruit they produce. He goes on to say, again, healthy trees don't bear bad fruit and diseased trees can't bear good fruit, verse 18. So there's an underlying assumption here. There's some expectation that those who are redeemed of God can tell the difference. This goes back to something we talked about a few sermons ago, about judging. When we were in verses 1 through 6, uh, we talked a lot about judgment, and this is where judgment, having a right judgment, really counts. We said back then that right judgment protects and preserves the church. You remember that? Judging according to a righteous judgment protects and preserves the church. Sadly, we can't assume I know, I, I know it's sad, but we can't just assume that anyone who wears the Christian label or says, I believe in Jesus, is truly a born-again believer. Tragically, we can't assume that pastors who teach and preach about Jesus actually know him at all. That's frightening, but here's what Jesus wants us to know. We can observe what people teach what it is they say they believe, and how they demonstrate they believe what they say they believe and how that they live. We can observe those things and we can determine whether or not they are what they say they are. And I want to make sure we all firmly grasp this this morning. The Word of God is how you know. That's how you know. The Word of God is how you know. We don't take someone else's word for it. We don't rely merely on our own intuition or how we feel about somebody. We take God's word for it. So the main idea this morning is we can tell who the imposters are by taking God's word for it. What does God say? Well, one thing God says in verse 19 is that every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. How do we know which trees those are? Jesus reiterates, verse 20, thus you will recognize them by their fruits. He does not want us to miss this. So, our two points this morning are going to be focused on just that, recognizing good fruit and bad fruit. And again, we don't determine for ourselves what we think good fruit and bad fruit looks like. We can get into a lot of trouble doing that. We can end up deceiving ourselves, right? We can... We can 
injure others. We can damage others, damage reputations. We can actually cause damage to the church, to the body of Christ, by, by just uh, making wrong judgments according to our own standards that way. We have to be able to appeal to something concrete, something unchanging and, and strictly objective, something outside of ourselves, and that something is the Word of God. So we're looking at bad fruit and good fruit and looking to judge righteously according to God's Word, taking God's Word for it when considering who the false prophets and imposters are. You know, because you can start to think that someone isn't a Christian just because you don't like what they say. Or you don't like the way that they say it. Or you can begin to think that someone is a Christian because you do like what they say. And you do like the way that they say it. Right? Got to take God's word for it. So looking first at bad fruit. We'll look at bad fruit and then we'll look at good fruit. Bad fruit looks like ignoring God's word or twisting God's word. Might look like a lot of things, it look like other things too, but that's the best way you can know. That's the bedrock. That's foundational. How does someone handle the word of God? Does he regard it lightly? Sometimes regarding it lightly can look like regarding it highly. He can wave his open Bible around as much as he wants when he preaches. But is does what he says match what God says in his word? What does God's word say about what that someone is saying? Or not saying, right? Bad fruit looks like ignoring scripture or twisting scripture. Once you get under all the veneer and all the smoke and mirrors, what false Christians and especially false prophets want people to do is to ignore or twist what God has said so that we will believe what they say. And when you, when you look at that, when I tell y'all that that is satanic, do you believe me or are you like, oh, well, I'd expect a preacher to say that? That is satanic. That is not an exaggeration. And it is not an overstatement. Ignoring and twisting God's word in that way is satanic. The fall of man began with questioning God's word. Do you remember that? The serpent tempted Eve. Eve rebutted with what God said. And the serpent replied, did God really say? It's all it took. Brothers and sisters, I'm not sure if you're aware, but make no mistake about it, there's a progressive Christianity out there. I don't know if you've heard that title, okay? But there's a progressive Christianity out there today gaining a lot of momentum, and that is their mantra. That is their creed. Did God really say? Did God really say that's a sin? Did God really say I can't? X, Y, Z. It's not a boogeyman tale. <laughs> it's real. There are wolves in sheep's clothing, like Jesus says, today. And we've got to be honest. These aren't just Christians who do things a little differently than us. It's a whole separate category. Okay, Christians can get all up in a tizzy over how people do things a little bit differently than they do. That's not what we're talking about. These people that ignore and twist God's word do not belong in the camp of people that just have different preferences than us, whose worship style looks a little different than us. They are not of us. I know our Southern charm can kind of bleed into our Christian principles a little bit, and it's easy for us to say, oh, well, bless their little hearts. Do not be so naive. It is satanic because it perverts the very word of God. We have to be aware of that. You've got to be able to see when the fruit's rotten so that you don't eat it. And you've got to be able to say, that's bad, so other people don't eat it either. Isn't that loving your neighbor? Are you going to see something's poisoned and be like, well, it's not for me, but you know, <laughs> if it floats your boat, 
We got to be able to recognize that. You're supposed to be able to destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10.5. Aren't we supposed to be able to do that? So beware of self-professing Christians who Christianity is foreign to Scripture. That's how you know. Beware of Christians whose Christianity, they say all the right things, right? They, they say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, I got saved, all this kind of stuff. If their Christianity, what it is that they say they believe and what it is that they do, is foreign to God's Word, then you don't take their word for it. You take God's word for it. And that's not being rude. It's not being rude. It's being discerning and making right judgments that protects you and protects and preserves Christ's church. So bad fruit looks like ignoring Scripture or twisting Scripture. And in both cases, here's a little bit closer look at kind of how that unfolds, what it looks like in the, in the false prophet, where it leads. So here's some sub points for you on false prophets for those of you taking notes. False prophets are generally most interested in being well-liked and honored among men. That's what they want. That's what they're in the game for. So this guy's rarely ever criticized, rarely ever offends anyone. His preaching is always so comforting and gives you the impression that you're okay, everything's okay. Everything's all right. Joel Osteen, anyone? And you know, if, it, if you're the one that points that out, and cries foul, right? Then you're just, you're just the one who's being curmudgeonly and difficult. You know, if you point your finger at that sort of thing, like I just did, then you're labeled as being one of those narrow-minded fundamentalists that makes Christianity look bad. Okay. Didn't Jesus just get done talking about how the gate is narrow and the way is hard? Did he not just go over that? So the next point on false prophets, false prophets are most likely going to present following Jesus as easy. It's not a narrow road. It's a six-lane superhighway with plenty of room for difference of opinion and interpretations and doctrines and whatever else have you. You can believe whatever you want. All you got to do is put a little Jesus sticker on it. And as long as you put that little Jesus sticker on it, nobody can criticize it for being inauthentic because that would make them unchristlike and divisive. You see how that works? False prophets seek the praise of men. They get it by presenting a false Christ, and they inevitably end up devouring the sheep. That's the way that works. They don't lay their lives down for the sheep. It's never why they were there in the first place. Their aim is to use the sheep to serve their own interests. They just use the church to elevate themselves instead of allowing themselves to be used to elevate Christ and his church. That's what bad fruit looks like, ignoring Scripture and asking you to either pay no mind to it or using it, using Scripture to get you to believe what they want you to believe. And what it almost always looks like from the start is man-pleasing. That's what it looks like. It's hard for us to imagine that, I know, because we think, you know, if someone's that, you know, uh, self-absorbed, if, that, if someone's that full of themselves and just uses people and lies all the time, how is that pleasing anyone? I mean, how do they get away with it, if that's the case? How many cult leaders would you like for me to name for you right now? Men who gathered people to themselves with sweet speech, revolutionary ideas, gathered people who would do anything for them, for the false prophet. Anything. Leave behind spouses and families and homes to live in squalor. David Koresh. People who would kill for the prophet. Charles Manson. People who would kill themselves for the prophet. Jim Jones. Remember him? 
It's where we get that saying, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Like, don't go for it. You know what all three of those men have in common? Using the Bible in the name of Jesus to get people to follow them. Jim Jones was an ordained Christian minister at one point. Did you know that? Crept his way right into the church. And he even meted, he, he admitted he was never sincere. He, he wanted Christianity and the influence of the Bible, under his own, own admission, wanted Christianity and the influence of the Bible to collapse. And the best way he knew to do it was from the inside. Led a lot of people astray, didn't he? He asked over 900 people to drink poison in a jungle, and they did it. And you've probably heard about that. You know, it took them, it took four hours for all of them to die. Children convulsing on the floor. Slow, agonizing death. People choking on their own blood and vomit. Let me ask you a question. Do you think they agreed to do that because they didn't like him? He said things they wanted to hear. He gave them what he convinced them they wanted. That's what false prophets in the church do. They can't get far by talking about sin and judgment. They can't get far by being specific and exclusive and sticking to the Word of God. They can't afford to alienate anyone if they're going to have followers. So what it looks like at first is making church comfortable for people who have no interest in the Savior's blood. No mention of sin. No mention of atonement for sin. No mention of repentance and little to no emphasis on the Word of God. More emphasis on messages people will find motivating and help them believe in themselves more and to live fuller and richer lives. Beware of teachers who stand on anything other than the Word of God. They can claim they had a revelation from God all they want and expect you to yield to that authority. But Jesus calls us to submit to His authority in His revealed Word. And remember, Jesus only ever appeals to two authorities in his earthly ministry. I think we may have talked about this before in another sermon. Jesus only ever appeals to two authorities. He appeals to what was written, the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, right? And he appeals to his own authority. And newsflash, it's the same authority. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God who is very God of very God, equal in power and glory with the Father and with the Holy Spirit, is the Word that became flesh. And He is never at odds with what is revealed to us in Scripture because He is never at odds with Himself and He is one with the Father. And what He wants His disciples and all of us, we are His disciples, aren't we? What He wants all of us uh, to do is to ground everything we believe about God, about ourselves, about the world and everyone else that we meet, to ground all of that in His divine revelation to us. And anyone who diverts your attention away from it is a false prophet. That's how you can know. No matter what they say, no matter what they say, if someone is diverting your attention away from those things, understanding who God is, who we are, what the world is, what it's about, and other people in relation to us, if they're diverting your attention away from God's word to something else, they are a false prophet. You don't believe what they say, you take God's word for it. So that's bad fruit. We're going to look at good fruit now. What's good fruit look like? I'm drinking a lot of water this morning, y'all. I'm sorry. <clears throat> You may already know this, but people with the FBI and the Secret Service, people who deal with counterfeit money, they don't get good at doing what they do, spotting counterfeits, by learning about counterfeits. They don't get good at what they do by looking at the wrong thing. They get good at what they do by looking at the right thing. They study very, very carefully in the most minute detail the genuine article. So when a counterfeit comes across, 
they're able to recognize it as such. And that makes sense once you think about it, right? You, know, you don't have to be an expert in all the different kinds of counterfeits that are coming about and changing all of the time. You just have to be an expert in the genuine article. You only have to be good at one thing. Recognizing the real deal when you see it. Looking for certain things, and when you find that they're all there, you just know. That's this kind of fruit that we're talking about, good fruit. We don't have to be as good at spotting bad fruit as we do good fruit. If we know what good fruit looks like, we can more easily spot the false prophets and pretend Christians. So we want to know what good fruit looks like. One obvious way we probably all think of right away is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's great, but let me ask you two questions. How reliable is your assessment of the fruit of the Spirit in someone else's life? Two, how consistent are you in displaying the fruit of the Spirit in your own life? Remove the log before you remove the speck, right? Remember? So I'm not saying those things cannot be evidence in someone's life in a way that can be recognized, but I would argue there's a more objective way of identifying good fruit. Is there an obvious love of God's Word and a genuine desire to be more submitted to it? That's good fruit. And it's easier to see than all the rest, isn't it? A desire to be with God's people and a commitment to gathering together like this on the Lord's Day to worship Him, to partake of the means of grace together, that would be another one. If a love of God's Word, a desire to submit to it, and a desire to worship Him are absent from someone's life, they are not a Christian. Period. And it's not going to do you or them any good for you to go on pretending that they are. See, that cuts through all the subjective stuff, doesn't it? It cuts through all the layers of remaining sin that we can see in a person's life. We all have that. It cuts through the need for gifts of discernment and being a good judge of character. It's simpler and more objective than all that. If someone professes to be a Christian and has no interest in the things of God, he or she is not a Christian. I'm tempted to nuance that. I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm not going to nuance that. Standing on the authority of God's word, I tell you the truth. I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm asking you to believe the Bible. Does God's word say what I just said? That if someone is a Christian, he will delight in God's word. He will desire conformity to it, and he will desire to worship the God who saved him. We'd be here all night long if I read you all the places in the Bible where we could see that. We'd have to read the whole Bible. My voice won't take it today. Good fruit on the authority of Scripture looks like repentance and faith, doesn't it? And what does repentance and faith produce? Trust. Love and obedience. It leads to a love of his word, a desire to be changed by it, and a desire to worship him from a heart of gratitude and thanks for saving him, knowing he had no, no reason to. You can't meet Jesus and not be changed in those ways. There's some things that change in an instant, right? Right? There's some things that change in an instant, just in a blink of an eye. And there's other things that take a lot of time, sometimes a whole lifetime. So don't confuse ignorance of God's word where you are now with lacking a love for it, okay? I'd hate for you to confuse the two. Bill Pope got saved Thanksgiving, day before Thanksgiving. There's a lot of the Bible he hasn't read yet. But he sure is trying to make up for lost time. That's fruit in keeping with repentance. That's how you can know. A man says he's a Christian, you believe him, don't you? Because he can't get enough of God's word. 
He has a love of God's word, a desire to be more submitted to it, for his life to be more in conformity to it. And you see him here, ready to praise and worship the one who saved him. That's, that's what that looks like. So I don't want you to confuse uh, ignorance now with, with a lack of love for the word. It's not what we're talking about. You can fix ignorance, can't you? you can, that's good news. You can fix ignorance. If you have the fear of the Lord, you can fix ignorance because fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the fools who despise wisdom and instruction. They're the ones who, who hide back in the shadows and harden their hearts. If we're truly born of, of the Spirit, God will work in us through His Word and by His Spirit to transform our minds. That's going to happen. We will be convinced of the truth of Scripture if we're born again. And so while we may not have all of our theological ducks in a row from day one, we can know that one day we will. We can be sure. Here's the thing. Here's what I want you to remember. We can be sure if someone is viewing God's word rightly, they will view God rightly. If you have a right view of God's word, you will end up with a right view of God. Could take time. But this is, this is it right here. This is the foundation. That's how you know. That's why when it comes to telling whether someone is a Christian or not, like we said, we take God's word for it. Is God's word the authority over a person's life, and are they being trained by it? Are they teachable? You know, a lot of the other behavior or character stuff that we think of when we talk about seeing fruit in someone's life works itself out naturally over the course of sanctification. That's how that happens. You know, so maybe they're still a little rough around the edges, right? If we gave them a report card now, it won't look so good. But we can know what that report card will look like in the end because we know that the one who began a good work in that person will bring it to completion. We know what it'll look like, and here it is. Here's the determining factor. If they're letting the Word of God determine the course of their life, that's where they're going to end up. If they recognize the Word of God as the Word of the one true and living God, if they desire to be changed by it and through all their faults and foibles, they fall at the feet of Jesus to worship Him. That tree may look twiggy now, but it will bear good fruit. And we can know because God said so. We should expect to see fruit in keeping with repentance in a person's life if they claim to be a Christian, but you will not see it in someone who has a light view of God's Word or uses God's Word to justify their sin. I'm going to repeat that last line. You will not see that fruit come about in a person's life who has a light view of God's Word or uses God's Word to justify sin in their life. That's the easiest way to tell the difference between a wolf and a Christian the counterfeit, and the genuine article. A couple brief points of application here. <clears throat> we need to take Jesus' words and warning here, and we need to be able to apply it externally, yes, but we need to be able to apply it internally too, be able to examine ourselves. And I mentioned something earlier about progressive Christianity. That's a real thing. So I caution you to be aware of that, be listening out for it. Understand what it is that they're saying. And, and hear them, hear their arguments. Here's something I want you to understand. Just because somebody belongs in this camp or this camp or wears this label or that badge or this denomination or that denomination, you need to be able to recognize truth when you hear it, no matter whose mouth it comes from. Truth is truth. It's a constant. Contrary to popular opinion today, there is such a thing as an objective truth. Jesus says, your word is truth. And when we recognize that being spoken, no matter who, whose lips it comes from, we have to be able to recognize it as such. So it's important that you hear people for what they're saying and not hear them for what they're not saying. But you need to be critical. You need to be listening carefully. Are they standing firmly on the Word of God? But this is happening. It's creeping in. I want you to be aware of it. And it's creeping into historically, and, uh, h historically faithful and um, doctrinally sound churches and denominations. You know, it's not just these fringe outliers. I mean, this, it, this is creeping into what have historically been like rock-solid churches 
That's why we see things like ministers marrying gay couples. That would have never happened before. That's why you see uh, homosexuals being ordained as ministers. Never would have thought that before. How did it happen? How did that happen? How did we get here? Here's how we got here. It happened because wolves in sheep's clothing crept into the church, seeing, uh, sowing seeds of doubt as to what God actually said. That's how it happened. They make you feel like you're the one out of line with the person and character of Christ because you're being too narrow and divisive. If you take their word for it and not God's, they will have you convinced that you are not compassionate like Christ because you are uncompromising with sin. But here's what you need to know and take it to the bank. Jesus died for sin. We do not compromise with sin. We make no quarter for it in our lives, and we expect the same of our brothers and sisters. David, is it okay if I expect you to make no quarter for sin in your life? Do you not expect the same of me? We make no quarter for sin in our lives. What, what people in, in these camps uh, want to do is they want to get people away from taking God at his word. They want to get away from allowing scripture to speak for itself for Scripture to interpret Scripture, and they want us just to reason together as to what Jesus more likely meant, you know? And they say things like that. Well, we interpret Scripture as what Jesus actually meant and not man's misinterpretations. To which we would reply, are you not a man yourself? Is that not an interpretation you have there? Whose word am I supposed to take for it? Yours or God's? We stand on the word of God. We let God speak for himself. We allow scripture to interpret scripture and we don't let wolves convince us they're sheep. Applying this text to ourselves, we need to ask ourselves, are we, y'all, are we submitted to God's word? Are we really Do we possess the fruit we expect to see in others? Do we love God's word? Do we seek to be more obedient to it? And do we love and honor God and desire to worship him? To give him the praise that is due his holy name? You know, we can course correct for degrees of desire, all right? None of, none of us is as devout as we ought to be. We can course correct for degrees of desire, but are you at least sincere? Do you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is who the Bible says he is? That he died, not just for a cause, but for sin. And not just sin generally, but your sin. That he was buried and rose again bodily and sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven and will come one day to judge the living and the dead in the final resurrection. If you do, that's going to make you a certain kind of tree. Right? And if you don't, it's going to make you a different kind of tree. One that Jesus said is cut down and thrown into the fire. You don't have to take my word for it. Take God's word for it. Repent and believe the gospel. The true gospel. There's only one. This is a sensitive subject, and I debated on whether to bring it up, uh, but I'm going to because it's important. It's something we see a lot. and it, I just put it out there. What happens when people we love die? Don't we, don't we wish them into heaven? Did they talk about the Bible? Did they talk about their love for Christ? Christ? 
then why would you think that they're in heaven? I know it's hard, and I don't mean to hurt feelings. All right, I'm going somewhere with this. If somebody lived a whole life not caring anything about the Bible, not caring anything about Jesus, what he taught, what he, what he demands of his people, had no interest in, in the things of God, had no interest in the Savior's blood, and they die, and because we love them, we want to believe that they're someplace better. Is that what the Bible teaches? You can't love someone enough to get them into heaven, y'all. And that's why that sobering, painful prick you're feeling right now should motivate you to share the gospel liberally with those around you you love. Because what God's word says is that tree gets cut down. That tree gets thrown into the fire. And I think having a, a sobering awareness of that should motivate us to be fools for Christ, right? To be willing to have people say mean things about us, to have people not invite us to their party next year, to have people call us whatever kinds of names. Some of them might be true. We should be willing to take that if we love those people because we believe what God's word says is true. Closing up here, people say doctrine divides. You heard that before? Doctrine divides. You know, people talk about, you know, as, you know when we do things like we recite the Apostles' Creed, we have these historic creeds and confessions that we, we see uh, came through a lot of trouble and difficulty in the church. Times when uh, people were claiming one thing. You had false prophets saying, this is Christianity. And then you had people who said, no, 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 that's not Christianity. This is Christianity. And so those documents matter. They're not Scripture, but they are good summaries of what Scripture teaches, right? That's what gives us orthodoxy. And what people say is, well, that, that kind of stuff divides. No creed but Christ, they say. I don't need all that junk. No creed but Christ. That's a creed. You get that? That's a creed. No creed but Christ. So we've got to be able to anchor ourselves to something, and that needs to be Scripture. And Scripture does include doctrines. It includes teachings. And there's a right teaching, and there's a wrong teaching. It's not subjective. So yes, doctrine does divide. That's true. It divides truth from lies. It divides fact from fiction. And yes, it divides people who live on either side of that line. And here's the thing, it should. Jesus' sheep deserve to be protected. They are to be set apart, holy, guarded, and protected. So right judgment in these things protects and preserves the church. That's what it does. So we take God's word for it. People can say a lot of things. People can try to get you to believe a lot of things about them, about what they believe, and we can play the game of wait and see. We, we, we can try to look and be super discerning and try to figure out if we're seeing evidences of, you know, y'all don't watch me on Wednesday afternoon, okay? I'm going to mess up. Laura is too. Sweet as she is, Laura is going to mess up. You might watch her stumble a little bit and be like, I don't know! Right? There's a, more, there's a simpler, more objective way to be able to get at what Jesus is talking about here, being able to recognize good fruit. Is somebody submitted to the word of God, and is there a desire in their heart to worship the God who saved them? The end. Let's pray. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to stand firm on the truth of your word. Those of us here at King's Church, I pray that we would be faithful and unmoving Unable, as the scriptures tell us, to be tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes.
Lord, I pray you would make us a most wise and discerning people. Make us a courageous people, God. Because there are bullies out there, but because there are people we love who are lost out there too. Lord, we can expect that if, if they've hated you, we can expect they will hate us on your account. So make us bold and uncompromising, but also compassionate to speak the truth in love, but not as the world loves. You are love, God. Your love was made manifest among, among us that the Son was sent into the world so that we might live through him who died for our sins. And God, as we've said this morning, may we never give quarter to sin in our own lives or in your church. For your glory, for the good of your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.